All right, it is 10 a.m. Happy Easter, everyone, and welcome to the Minnesota Zen. <coughs> um, very glad that you're all here today. Um, my name is Deb Melke, and I'm one of the um, lay teachers here, and I've been a member here for over 10 years. So um, it's my pleasure to give this talk this morning because it's been a lot of fun to work on. Um, so Easter Sunday, it's a, uh, I think many of us may be going to gatherings later today with family and friends. Many of us may not be going to gatherings later. So in either case, it's a rather big celebration for um, many Christians in our world. And a part of me, I was raised Methodist, a part of me is still a Unitarian Universalist, and I'm a practicing Buddhist, but I feel open to celebrate all holidays, religious holidays with people. Well, maybe not all of them, but <laughs> most of them. Um, so my hope is that this is a happy and safe day for all of us. Um, my thoughts go out to the many who are not doing well today for a wide range of complex reasons. I'm going to get off that because I might start crying. Um, because it's a hard world. And there's a lot of people that are not doing well. So my thoughts go out to them, too. But my talk today will focus mostly on how we communicate with each other and possibly reduce conflicts. Um, I'm going to also use Katagiri and Dogen to help me out at the end. So they're some of my favorite teachers. So. The title of this talk is Let's Talk to Finding the Great Potu. And if I don't get to the Great Potu, Dwayne is going to be very upset with me. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll try. So, um, my idea for this talk came from a podcast uh, interview with Mudita Nisker and Dan Clerman who wrote a really helpful book called Let's Talk. Okay. And this got me very enthusiastic about finding out more about what they had to say about communicating with each other. Um, and during the interview, they both sounded like experienced Buddhist practitioners. Um, this also came out reading the book and they confirmed my impression at the end of the book when they discovered the spiritual side to their approach with um, communication. So, I'm interested in learning how to say things better. Um, I don't always find it easy to find the right words and communicate the thoughts and feelings um, that are in my head. And I previously gave a talk um, on a Tuesday night called Less Talk. So that's why this is Let's Talk too. Um, and I want to focus today on just one of the chapters. And this is a chapter that describes I language and you language. Um, this has a lot to do with how we perceive and define the self. So in part two of Let's Talk Too, I'm going to get some help then from Category and Dogen on this. So, I language and you language. I'm going to start with a paragraph from the book because they say it so well that I can't um, improve on what they have to say. This really resonates with me. Um, imagine you're not able to get in touch with a close friend. After texting them several times throughout the week, you decide to call them. Which of the following options are you more inclined to use? You're avoiding me. Or, I've been having a hard time reaching you. Both options describe the same situation, but each does so in a different way. I'm having a hard time reaching you is an example of I language. It expresses what you're experiencing. You're avoiding me is an example of you language. It conveys what you think your friend is doing. Um, 
with eye language, you're talking about your own experience, how you think and feel. And with you language, you're saying what you imagine others might be thinking or feeling. Um, you language often projects your own assumptions about others onto them and characterizes their behavior a certain way. When you language implies there's a negative emotion behind their behavior, it can become the sibling of blame or thinking that others are the cause of your thoughts, feelings, or behavior. An unhelpful side effect is that you may mistakenly think your projections are facts. So I just can't possibly say it <laughs> better than what they say. But we'll go on here. And um, so I language is using sentences like, I'm going to keep this simple, I'm feeling sad. I miss seeing you last week, or I would really like a chocolate ice cream cone. Um, and sometimes using I language seems self-centered. Uh, and when we overuse the word in our speech or writing, it seems like, oh, maybe we shouldn't be doing this in our Zen practice. We're supposed to be more about what's not the self. Um, isn't the self both impermanent and unconditional in our teachings? We talk of small, egotistical mind versus the big mind, open mind. Um, and if you really try to find the self, it's hard to do when we're sitting and thinking about these things. So let's see how they describe the difference between you language and I language. So these are some examples. For, so they say, I language reports your own thoughts about your experience, what you're just experiencing right now. You report your thoughts about another person, which is kind of like external judgments. Um, I language describes what you experience in response to the other person. And you language characterizes or describes the other person or their behavior, kind of making some assumptions. So I'm gonna try an exercise with this group um, and uh, to show how this works and have you try it too. So I'm gonna demonstrate, oh Killian, I just saw you. I'm gonna demonstrate with you, Killian. Okay, so Killian, I really like your shirt. Or you like, your shirt looks great little difference. I'm so happy to see you today. You haven't been coming to the Zen Center much lately. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, what I'd like you to do, okay, this is kind of the exercise. I would like you all to pair up with someone next to you. And if you're kind of the odd man out, you can move your chair or find someone else. Um, and, uh, or you can just do this with yourself internally, with your own mind, okay? And you on Zoom, I'm presuming you may not have someone sitting next to you. You can either do this in your own mind or with anyone who's there or your dog, cat, or even make an imaginary friend, okay? So, but what I'm gonna do for doing this now, and this is the experiment, um, I apologize to you, those of you who are um, noise averse, don't like to have like a lot of noise because this will get noisy. Okay, I'm going to ring the bell. I need a bell. I'm going to ring a bell first and then have you just talk to the person you're next to and say something to them, about them, using eye language. And it can be just simple. It's like, I like your smile. I like your hair. Just, just a simple thing. And then the other person will do the same back. Not necessarily in response, but just a comment. Okay? High language first. Okay. And for you guys, I'm going to mute this because it's going to get too noisy for you. But I'm going to ring the bell first, mute you. And then as things quiet down, I just want to sit for a couple of minutes and I'll ring the bell again. Okay? 
Any questions on that? Do Please. we each say something? I yes, you each say something, but one at a time. <laughs> okay, so here we go. I'm gonna ring the bell and then mute you. Okay, and you guys can go at it. Okay. You guys had a lot to say to each other. <laughs> so the next uh, piece of this exercise is to use you language. And you can switch what you did with I or just pick a new uh, sentence or two for you language. So I'm going to ring the bell to start with, mute you guys, um, and we'll be back. Thank, thank you for your patience online because this was a very um, loquacious, um, active group here. Um, I really appreciate everyone's involvement in this exercise and I hope that it helps somewhat. Um, okay, so I language can sound self-centered, selfish, unproductive, and most people have an easier time talking about other people than themselves, or at least that's what I have experienced. Um, and this was certainly how I was raised. Uh, it wasn't until I was in my 40s or 50s that I was able to say, I love you to my mother. Because this is not a part of our family kind of way of expressing ourselves. And it took her actually several years to be able to say it back. Now, that seems to me kind of sad. And uh, I have. Ben's family to thank for that because his family has been much better about showing affection and particularly my mother-in-law um, who is very good at expressing her thoughts, feelings, and affection. So I'm very grateful to the people that have helped me with that through the years. So the benefit of using more I language is that it is a more accurate way to express our own thoughts, feelings, and motivations. And it also can reveal what we're experiencing when we actually state things out loud. Um, it can help reduce misunderstandings, particularly in tense situations or times of conflict, where you express more what you're experiencing within that conflict. Um, and others can make assumptions that lead to misunderstandings if we don't say specifically um, what we are thinking and feeling by using I language. So I language can um, evoke less defensiveness and create more receptivity 
and the person we're talking with. Um, and most people really kind of don't like their behaviors called out. I've kind of noticed that if you're critical, <laughs> then it's kind of don't get a really good uh, feedback from that. So, for example, it may be better to say, I feel like I haven't gotten my point across, rather than say, you just don't get it. <laughs> it kind of changes that flavor. Um, now, some people will not care about what you're experiencing or how you feel. Um, and sometimes we have to deal with that level of negativity in other people. And sometimes in conflict, we just end up maybe needing to walk away from it, or even just confronting the lack of empathy that we're feeling. Um, so, one of my favorite lines comes from uh, African American woman Loretta Ross, who talks a lot about calling in culture versus calling out culture. And she has a really good YouTube video if you ever want to watch her, Loretta Ross. So she says that you shouldn't walk away if someone said something really offensive and negative. But what she offers up to say back is something like, I beg your pardon? You know, so if someone says something really racist or you know, derogatory, um, I beg your pardon, or what did you just say? You know, just calling them into more of a awareness that whatever it is that was said was not acceptable. And the authors of this book say that another benefit of using more I language is that it can be empowering. Um, it allows us to notice our own thoughts and feelings, revealing assumptions and beliefs we use to make sense of our life. So just hearing ourselves express these things out loud and with this self-knowledge, it's possible to feel less helpless and less lonely, too. So, and when we look at the downside of you language, is that it's more likely to lead to harder negative thoughts or emotions. And it emphasizes the stories we tell ourselves that make this feel like a concrete and unchanging <coughs> world. Um, and it may allow us to blame others for our own unhappiness, thinking that we are really right about these events that we're in conflict with. Um, with I language, we can focus more on our own experiences rather than creating stories about the other person. But we can also have false I language. Um, if I say, Ben, I think that you should have done the dishes. <laughs> um, that's really not high language. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I'm kind of upset that the dishes haven't been washed by themselves. The, 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 the dishwashing fairies, I guess. Um, I don't know. Anyway. But you see what I mean. So, um, but they also say that this is rather a difficult um, process to do. Uh, the authors state that the use of high language is one of the more advanced skills they teach. So it does take a lot of practice. This just doesn't happen naturally. And it's like a process of seeing, okay, if I use, say, things this way, how does it work if I say things a different way? And kind of monitoring our own um, experience with this. So I'm going to finish up because again they say something that's so delightful. So I language is one of the more advanced skills we teach. It requires not only a change in your interpersonal communication, but also a shift in the way you think. So most people have spent their whole lives thinking in you language, and altering this habit isn't something that happens overnight. But here's where the language principle can work to your advantage. Language not only reveals, but also shapes how you think. 
Using I language, therefore, is a powerful way to shape new patterns of thought. And over time, changing what you say and how you say it can profoundly change how you see yourself, others, and the world. In other words, I language can be revelatory. Being both attentive to your language and patient with yourself as you practice I language will serve you long, well in the long run. So, I like these guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but this is Let's Talk too. so it's two parts, too. Okay? So let me... Keep track of time. Oh, we're doing really well on time. You guys, this is great. Because I don't want to leave the part two out. This is fun. Okay, so not everyone will respond to our attempts to share, inter to share personal experiences. So how do we respond to that? So I'm going to start with a help from category. And I apologize. Um, I did not make enough copies, but I would like you to share. This is um, Category's poem called Peaceful Life. And maybe, yeah, do you want to make some more? Because I got 15, but okay. even if you share, I think, I was expecting Easter to be like nobody here. <laughs> so I'll just start sending them around. There. We can take a picture. Oh, you are so bright. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. I'm really appreciative of that suggestion. <laughs> Not natural. Okay. Go ahead. And just pass around and try to share two to three. I think you can print this big enough. So. And um, I'm going to reshare it on the chat in case someone came in after. I mean, if, you, if, you able, if you call the chat, you'll be able to see it. Okay. But if someone just came late, will they be able to see it? Okay, great. Can everyone see that on the chat, the poem there? Just uh, let me know if you can't see it. Oh, Nick, you can't see it. So I think sometimes you have to reshare it. There you go. Somebody just reshared it as well. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much, yeah, Michelle. Open here and you can see it. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. <laughs> now, if I were really in like Ben's fashion, I would chant this poem, but I, I can't really uh, get myself to chant this poem, cause, so I'll just read it out. But uh, if anyone wants to join me while I'm reading it, feel free. Okay. Um, Peaceful Life by Dinan Kagiri. Just to note, Kagiri was the founding teacher for the Zen Center. So, being told that it is impossible, one believes in despair. Is that so? Being told that it is possible, one believes in excitement. That's right. But whichever is chosen, it does not fit one's heart neatly. Being asked, what is unfitting? I don't know what it is, but my heart knows somehow. I feel an irresistible desire to know. What a mystery a human is. As to this mystery, clarifying, knowing how to live, knowing how to talk with people, demonstrating and teaching, this is the Buddha. From my human eyes, I feel it's really impossible to become a Buddha. But this I, regarding what the Buddha does, vows to practice, to aspire, to be resolute, and tells myself, yes, I will. Just practice right here and now, and achieve continuity endlessly, forever. This is living in vow. Here in what life for life found. Thank you. So, um, 
And this poem category discusses the I and the difficulty of knowing how to live and knowing how to talk with people. Now, however, I found another translation of this and it's in Shahako Okamura's Living by Vow where it's translated how to walk with people. So my whole basis of like keying in on this poem was how to talk with people. But I think I'm going to figure out someday if there's like maybe some Japanese reason why it's either way. But for now we're talking and walking. Um, and it's the impossibility of living the peaceful life leads to despair while the possibility of living the peaceful life leads to excitement yet neither quite fits the heart. Um, however, the vow to practice, to aspire, and to live the Buddha way is where the peaceful life is found. So I first heard this poem in a retreat called Sitting with the Sutras and Rosemary Taylor led the retreat and we were supposed to focus in on one or two lines um, and sit with them and that was the line that struck me was knowing how to talk with people. He also uses a lot of I statements in this poem and the struggle to find a peaceful life. In the end he tells himself that it's important to practice right here and now with a commitment to achieving continuity and commitment to living in vow. And then what's the name of this temple? Benshoji. Which means Living in Vow Temple. Living in Vow Temple, which is uh, I think part of his commitment to this living in vow. <clears throat> so the experience of self as an impermanent and conditional I is not necessarily intuitive to ourselves. And I think that's how he's using the I in this. It's not a permanent I, like a I with a soul that's never changing. <clears throat> but I call this um, experience of self as impermanent and conditional as getting away from this indoctrination we have of the self that in growing up and our parental guidance, friends, family, culture, society, all lead us to think of ourselves as an independent, separate, permanent self. And that I think what he's recommending is a different approach um, to this idea of self. Um, I have a certain understanding of who I am and we all pretty much do as human beings. I think it's really hard to get away from that. But it's not always accurate and true. And also, um, we have in our culture a concept of in eternal individual soul. Um, but I'm going to go to Dogen now for help with this. And, uh, okay. Nobody's getting up and running out of the room. <laughs> Thank you. Who's <laughs> Dogen? <Yeah. laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so Dogen is like uh, one of those Japanese, uh, Japanese um, really kind of founder of our Soto Zen. So we take a lot from his teachings, but reading Dogen can be very confusing and um, kind of like, what does he mean here? But this is, this is good Dogen. Well, it's all good Dogen. It's all bad Dogen. I don't know. Anyway, I like this stuff. So, this is chapter 75, and I'm taking it out of um, Shobo Genzo, which is four volumes, took me over five years to read this set. Um, and it's Nishijima's and Shoto Cross uh, translation. There are new translations out, but I like this one. So the chapter is titled Jisho Zanmai, or Samadhi as the Experience of the Self. Okay, I'm going to go to one of our Zen priests in training, or priests. What is Samadhi? Because otherwise I'm going to go to Google. 
Okay, I'm going to go to Google. Google says, Samadhi, a state of intense concentration achieved through meditation. And in Hindu yoga, this is regarded as the final stage at which union with the divine is reached. So, but Dogen, this is what Dogen says about Samadhi. Samadhi is the experience of the self. Okay, I'll leave this. It is what is called sometimes to follow a good counselor and sometimes to follow the sutras. Sutras are teachings, the Buddhist teachings. And he starts with a koan. The teacher asks the monk, do you rely upon practice and experience or not? The monk says, it's not that there is no practice and experience, but to taint it is impossible. So following a good counselor. Sometimes we see half of each other's face and sometimes we see half of each other's body. Sometimes we see the whole of each other's face and sometimes we see the whole of each other's body. We experience in each other the state in which the head of a god is covered with hair. And we experience in each other the face of a demon topped by horns. The vigorous activity of following a good counselor is the actual condition of exploring the self. Okay, exploring the self that looks like a god, looks like a demon with horns. Following the sutras, he says. In general, when we follow and practice the sutras, the sutras truly come forth, the teachings come forth. The meaning of the sutras is the whole universe in 10 directions, mountains, rivers, and the earth, grass and trees, self and others. It is eating meals and putting on clothes, instantaneous move movements, and demeanors. The teachings are sutras that have been translated into Chinese from the Sanskrit texts of India, not even 5,000 fascicles, three vehicles, five vehicles, nine parts, and the 12 parts. They are all that we should follow and practice. Even if we intended to void following them, it would be quite impossible. We're already following them. A sutra is naturally a sutra of the self, and a good counselor is naturally a good counselor of the self. To take up the hundred weeds is to take up the self. To take up the 10,000 trees is to take up the self. So there's so much in this chapter that I found to be amazing, somewhat mysterious, confusing, and beautiful. So Dogen is talking about how we interact and understand our own experience in life and our own experience with the external world. And this is the teaching of Zen practice, is how we're practicing this. He even says that preaching is not necessarily connected with self and other. Preaching for others is just preaching for the self. It's listening and preaching in which self and self experience is the same state. One ear is listening, one ear is preaching, one tongue is preaching, one tongue is listening. We're all learning from each other and learning from our experiences, our self preaching. So, Norm Fisher also says, there are no teachers of Zen. It's your own experience, this very moment, that is your Dharma, your teaching. He didn't say that there's no Zen, there's no teachers of Zen, which is actually from an older um, koan. So this is access to your beginner's mind, what we find in many of our sutras and teachings. Um, it's our own experience as it is. It's both the experience of using I language and the experience of using you language. It's keeping ourselves open to exploring and practicing these teachings.
And we all share these teachings and experiences together every time we get together with each other. We both listen and talk with our ears and listen and talk with our tongues. And our peaceful life is continuing to practice and to learn about ourselves and each other, committed to keeping open and committing to keeping our vow to help all others. But Dogen also encourages us to have a teacher or a friend to help with this, not to try to do this all on our own. The Buddha within us meets the Buddha in a good friend or a teacher as we practice here right now. And we need this support from our teachers who have been practicing for years, committed to freeing all beings, and our fellow Sangha members with whom we are in continuous practice. Okay. Now, does anyone want to hear about finding the great Potu? <laughs> okay. So, recently this fall, I took a trip to Costa Rica and in October. And one of the extra excursions was a night tour into the jungle. So only three of us signed up for this trip. And so we had three signed up and three guides. Um, we drove in a Jeep on a long dirt road through jungle past sugarcane fields in the dark. And I had no idea where we were or where we were going. But we arrived at a clearing which had a small hut and an open shed with a saddled horse tied up to the shed. It's like, that's a bit odd. It was a little surrealistic. Um, so our guide and the special night tour guide took us on a trail through the jungle. And we saw a young boa constrictor curled up in a pile of bananas. We saw poison dart frogs, snakes, tree snakes, insects, spiders, and our guide seemed very skilled and in finding interesting creatures that to me were hidden from view. So they're just able to spot them. And they took delight in finding and seeing these creatures of the night. So about three to four times I noticed what looked to be like a star twinkling in the treetop. I was like, well, this is a cloud, cloudy night. There's no houses around. It's like, why is there a star up there? But um, I didn't ask about it and I didn't think too much more about it. I just kind of filed it away in my brain as an interesting but weird information. There's a lot in my brain that stores that <laughs> interesting but weird information. Um, and towards the end of our night walk, the lead guide stopped and set up a telephoto lens on a tripod, pointed it into, across the road and into the treetop. And there, with the help of a strong light, we saw one of the strangest birds I've ever seen, um, the great Potu. It was so camouflaged and looks like the end of a crooked fence post that birders rarely see this even during the day. It's one of those. I think there's other camouflage birds, but this, this is really camouflage. Um, but the guide said, just mentioned that, oh yeah, its eyes reflect so much light that it looks like stars in the trees. Oh. Those were the stars in the trees. Yay, I figured it out. Um, okay, this feels like an overextended metaphor to me, but I'm going to go for it. Um, but it seems similar to our trying to find answers in the dark to questions that are difficult even to voice. Our teachers here are like the guides who by walking this trail at night over and over again can help us find even what's hidden in the light of day. So I am most grateful to our teachers here at the Zen Center. And I will say that Tim Burkett started me out on this path 50 years ago, and I would name more names, but I think we want to end on time today, because it'll take a long time for my gratitude to all the teachers um, that we've had here. So, let's talk.
I'd be happy to hear your comments and questions online. You can raise your hand or just unmute, um, uh, and we can talk about the I language, you language, home, what we're going to do the rest of the day. Yes? Well, should we, we, I mean, the I language, if I were saying to these thousand trees that are part of me, um, I mean, I could say you don't feel it when I chop you down. I, I mean, I don't, I don't believe you feel it when you chop me down. I mean, at some point there is this interobjectivity, intersubjectivity, mm -hmm. which, you know, there is this interobjective, intersubjective world, which is, is consequential. And, um, <coughs> and, and I let language doesn't, I think you kind of actually touched on this. It, it, you, you know, we can't use I language to avoid, you know, um, violations of this intersubjective and interobjective inter right. reality. Right. Yeah, I think when I think about the 10,000 trees, it kind of opens up the whole, my love for everything, the natural world and the forest and the woods and the ecosystems. And so when I use I language, I would say, my heart is deeply wounded. I feel deeply wounded when trees get cut down, when, you know, ecosystems are vanquished for more housing, you know, that that is my I language. And I acknowledge that it, it, it feels hurt. You know, I feel the pain of that. Um, and so then when we deal with people who don't feel that pain, then you, the way to communicate that is to say, not say anything about them, but to say something about you, and hopefully that breaks through that solipsistic I. Yeah, and I, I think, um, I, I hope you guys can hear the question, but I think it also lets them be aware that whatever actions there are, are affecting a lot of us, when we can um, voice that, and, and however we can. Yeah. But you can't ask for empathy and uh, understanding from everyone, right? <laughs> I would like to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Yes, Diana. Um, thank you so much for your talk today. I really appreciate how you um, presented these two possible ways of communicating. Um, and connected that to our um, continued development. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thank you for bringing in Dogen, because <laughs> I think that he is actually pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think we have a lot of Dogen fans, but it, it can be kind of like confusing and hard to read. and. It's why it took me over five years to read, because some days I could do it, and it's other times like, oh no, I can't go there. <laughs> yeah, but thank you. Yeah. yeah. Anybody online? I really appreciate everyone being here today. Well, with that, yeah, I think... I, I got oh, a oh, 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 we got another one. Please, Ben. Yeah. I wonder, would you... Um, be willing to just talk a little bit more about sort of the I language and the the and using it, understanding that other people are impermanent and we're impermanent. Mm -hmm. Something about that impermanence part and the value of it, given that we are developing. Yeah, I think um, for me the I language because if I use it in a way that expresses experience it's kind of reflecting more what I'm experiencing right now. And um, instead of building up a story about, okay, that person did this thing, it was wrong, you know, and building up this story about how bad that other person is, how many mistakes were made. And we can do that, we do that all the time. because. I had trouble sleeping last night for a while, and my brain started going into all this storytelling about all the things happening in this world. And it's like, you know, my experience was not being able to sleep. 
But my brain just started building these big stories about this person's doing that, that's wrong, that's person. And it's like, I don't think that's very helpful sometimes. I mean, to try to solve all the problems of the world and <clears throat> try to identify all the people that, if they'd only be better people, <laughs> would this world. I mean, yeah, it's, it's easy to fall into that. You know, especially if we're in conflict with people that are families or workplaces and stuff to, you know, have that story about they did this wrong and I'm right. But this saying, I'm experiencing this, what am I experiencing now? I'm experiencing pain, fear, humiliation. Um, I'm not getting my way. Oh, that's part of suffering. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, but <laughs> thank you. Okay, anybody else? Please, Barbara. Um, there's been more, I've heard more here. Um, there was another talk by another um, woman about communication. Yeah. And um, communicating, and she brought up the fact that in our world today, it is so important to communicate with each other and, and try and do it as well as we can. The talk was about listening. Yeah. But I just want to thank you for talking about this. And I think I would like to hear more. <laughs> yeah, Bar Bar about, yeah, um, thank you. Learning about good communication. Yeah, Barbara was saying the importance of, you know, learning good communication in this world today. And I think that's part of what I feel is our practice, is just learning how to be communicators um, with whatever we're doing. So thank you, Barbara, for that comment. And listening. Listening is so important, too, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I've heard of the using I statements before. Yeah. And that works well when you're having friction with somebody. I'm curious about your point of view on when you want to give somebody a compliment, the using the I statement to me seems to be taking the focus off of them and putting it back on myself. So it's kind of like the difference between I think that sweater looks good on you versus you make that sweater look good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that and you make that probably are the same. They're probably, you know, again, that's the I statement that's being flipped into a you. I think that you you know, look good in that sweater. But I can hear what you're asking. And it's about, um, no, I think I've lost my train of thought, which is fine. Uh, that I language and describing your experience, oh, with positive, saying positive things can be actually um, not helpful either to say, you know, like, oh, you have great hair. Right, and I might be thinking, I got out of bed and it's bed hair. What is this person? You know, so it's still kind of making an assumption that may make that other people feel either um, self-conscious or. But I like your hair. I mean, it's subtle, but boy, I'd like to have a hairstylist that would cut my hair like that. <laughs> <laughs> But, it, you know, it is, they, they do, and I'm not the expert in this by any means, but they do say even positive language, using you language, can be um, a problem. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we're time for announcements here. Um, thank you, everyone.